Matthew chapter 26, our reading this evening, Matthew 26. We will begin reading in verse 36 and read to the end of the chapter. And when Mez comes, he'll give attention to the final paragraph in the chapter. Picking up in verse 36 of Matthew chapter 26, then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. And he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, So you men could not keep watch for, with me for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again a second time and prayed, saying, My father, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, your will be done. Again, he he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them again and went away and prayed a third time, saying the same thing once more. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. While he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, came up accompanied by a large crowd with swords and clubs who came from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now he who was betraying him gave them a sign saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him. Immediately, Judas went to Jesus and said, Hail, Rabbi. And kissed him. Then Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you have come for. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus reached and drew out his sword and struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? How then will the scriptures be fulfilled, which say that it must happen this way? At that time, Jesus said to the crowds, have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as you would against a robber? Every day I used to sit in the temple teaching and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place to fulfill the scriptures of the prophets. Then all the disciples left him and fled. Those who had seized Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were gathered together. But Peter was following him at a distance as far as the courtyard of the high priest and entered in and sat down with the officers to see the outcome. Now the chief priests and the whole council kept trying to obtain false testimony against Jesus so that they might put him to death. They did not find any, even though many false witnesses came forward. But later on, two came forward and said, This man stated, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. The high priest stood up and said to him, Do you not answer? What is it that these men are testifying against you? But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, you have said it yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, he has blasphemed. What further need do we have of witnesses? Behold, you have now heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They answered, he deserves death. Then they spat in his face and beat him with their fists, and others slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, you Christ, who is the one who hit you? Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him and said, You too were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them all, saying, 
I do not know what you are talking about. When he had gone out to the gateway, another servant girl saw him and said to those who were there, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied it with an oath, I do not know the man. A little later the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Surely you too are one of them, for even the way you talk gives you away. Then he began to curse and swear, I do not know the man. And immediately a rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the word which Jesus had said, Before a rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Okay, good evening. Am I on? Am I good? I can't hear myself, so you'll have to help me out here, people. I can't see you either. I'm blind as a bat. Um, it's, I was trying to work out how long it's been here. It's been at least four years since I was in America. Um, and obviously a little thing called COVID happened in between then. Um, I don't know about uh, what happened in the States. I imagine it different place to place, but we probably had in Scotland one of the most restrictive, oppressive regimes, certainly in Europe, probably in the world. Everything shut down. Um, I'll tell you what didn't shut down, what, though, and that was the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we were one of very, well, one of very, very few churches I would know in the UK. We actually um, planted a church midway through the pandemic, uh, despite the restrictions. So um, Jesus is alive and well, and he's doing good stuff in Scotland. Uh, we currently have uh, 20 schemes. It's our 10th anniversary coming up in November, um, and we currently have 11 congregations that we've planted or uh, revitalized during that time, and we have another three coming online in Glasgow in the next 12 months. So we praise the Lord for that. Thank you for the support. Uh, of this church. Some of you may know me, some of you probably don't know me, but, uh, uh, the, but Big A uh, 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 and the boys here have been uh, at Pastor Anthony. Uh, he's the Big A. And uh, it's been a real help to us and a real support to us, and uh, we're grateful uh, for that and for everything that uh, the Lord is doing in Scotland. Now, we, I've been on a, we've been here, me and a friend of mine, Mark, we arrived last Saturday, um, and I, can't, I don't know how many states we've been to. I don't know how many times I've spoken. I know getting here today was my 10th flight this week. Um, we got here a couple of hours ago, so you'll forgive me if I'm a little bit dazed. Um, I only know it's Sunday because we're in church. So um. Now, I'm going to break every rule I give to my young men preaching about preaching tonight. So... Forgive me for that, particularly when it comes to exposition. Uh, during uh, the last few years, uh, a church uh, has been going through the book of Matthew, Matthew's Gospel. It's been a great book uh, for us. And um, as the verses have been read out to you this evening, Matthew 26 is probably one of the richest chapters, isn't it, in the whole of Matthew's Gospel. I'm going to ignore every obvious text and message of Matthew 26. And I just want to focus tonight on... Um, verses 69 through 75, which seem bizarre and may seem bizarre to you. I don't want to handle the text particularly expositionally, but I do want to look. Uh, when I was studying the book and I came across this text, I hadn't planned to preach on the text. I said, Peter, he denies him. Let's move along. Uh, but some, some stuff really struck me about this paragraph. And, um, and so I, I just want to share uh, these things with you tonight. But before we do that, while you're looking and finding Matthew 26, verse 69, can we just pray again? Let's pray together. Lord, we love you. We've been singing about it. We have been talking about it, Lord. But the good news of the gospel is our everything. Without you, Lord, without the gospel, what are we? Who are we? Where would we be? It is terrifying to think. And yet, we do have the gospel. We do have the Lord Jesus Christ who came and lived that perfect life, who died that death, that those who trust in him may live. And Father, again, 
You have not left us scrabbling around in the dark, trying to find out information about you. You've given us your word. Every single bit of it, your perfect word to us, Lord. So pray this evening, however we've come here, whatever reason we've come here with, whatever troubles we've brought with us, Lord, that, we, that you by your spirit would minister to us and our minds and hearts and wills would be challenged and moved by the power of your Holy Spirit for the glory of your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, one of the great things um, about the Bible is that there are so many losers in it. Loads of losers to choose. One of the great things about traveling the world is it doesn't matter which country I'm in, it doesn't matter what kind of church I'm in, I'm always going to stand before a group of losers. And it's encouraging for a loser like me. And I think one of the things that losers in the Bible do for losers like us is they make us look pretty good, don't they? They make us pe feel pretty good about ourselves. And I love Peter because he really is an idiot, isn't he? And what I find fascinating about this text, and maybe I'm just an obscure little, well, I am an obscure little fellow, but what I find fascinating about this text is the fact that it's in this gospel in the first place. I mean, how bad does this paragraph make Peter look? Look back in verse 33, when Peter was around the boys, he was a different guy, wasn't he? He's like all men when they get around their little posse. He was the tough guy. He was the hard guy. I'll never deny you, Jesus. In fact, he says in verse 35, in fact, I'm willing to die for you, Lord. No problem. Forget these losers. I'm your man, Jesus. I will definitely have your back. Then we read, we've read in the chapter, as uh, has been read for us in uh, but, but verse 47, and uh, the, the events that lead to Jesus', Jesus arrest. We know Judas betrays the Lord, and we know Peter at least fulfills half his promise, steps forward, chops the guy's ear off. And Jesus says to Peter, listen, calm down, son. That's a transliteration from the Scottish. And he heals the man. And then we read these tragic words, I think, at the end of verse of verse 56. And we read, don't we? Then all the disciples left him and fled. And we know Jesus predicted it. There's no surprises in this text. And then we get the, the, the events in, in, in verses 57 to 68 of the, the account of Jesus' illegal trial, his conviction on these false charges. And then we get to this little paragraph. And by the time uh, this gospel's uh, uh, out and about uh, uh, among the churches, Peter is the leader of the church in Jerusalem. He's a powerful man. He's an extremely powerful and influential Christian. So think about it for a minute. One of the most powerful men in the early church, one of the most influential men in the early church. So if you want information about you getting out into the public domain, you want information that doesn't make you look bad, do you? You want information that looks you, makes you look pretty heroic. After all, you're the guy who's going to write to the church and tell them to persevere under severe persecution, right? That's who that guy was. So this story here is a little bit inconvenient, isn't it? Which makes me love the Bible, which makes uh, this whole thing stand out to me. How would you like it if a man in his, uh, uh, his, his, his sphere of influence and a story circulates that you lost your courage in front of a slave girl? You're telling believers to stand firm under persecution, and yet you, Peter, ran off when a couple of little girls challenged you. And you wouldn't want that circulating, would you? because your credibility would be a bit short. Well, that's the beauty of the Bible, right? It's not removed. It's not edited. It's the beauty of the Bible. It's the beauty of the gospel. It presents people warts and all. It presents people failures and all. It pre presents people sins and all. 
Here's the great apostle Peter, full of it in front of his friends. And yet here he is, shamed and broken, denying his Lord. It's not even like it's to a Roman centurion or something. It's a girl. It's not even a girl. It's a slave girl crying his eyes out by the end of the chapter. And yet, is that the same Peter that is, was the rock upon which Christ built the church? Christ builds the church, he says, upon this man, a failure, a coward, and as we'll go on to see, a liar. And Judas, remember, has just got finished betraying the Lord. And this is the man, Peter, who swore at all costs, I will not do that, Lord. The same man, incidentally, who couldn't watch Jesus back for an hour while he prayed. The same man who denies the Lord for fear of his life. And so this is a man who's a picture of us all, right? This is a man in whom the the Spirit of God was, was strong, but his flesh, unfortunately, was weak. Here we have a fallible human disciple of Jesus. And that's why when we read a text like this, we should leave the text feeling that we're more like Peter than we're ever like the Lord. Because how many, how many of us in the building tonight have made big promises to God? Maybe you're in church on a Sunday, you've had a nice prayer. Maybe, the, maybe Big Ace preached a banger this week and you feel convicted. In a little prayer, you get your head down, you feel the Lord speaking to you. You think, listen, Lord, I'm getting out of that relationship. Listen, Lord, I am going to repent of that. Listen, Lord, I'm not going to do this anymore. And before you get to the door or the car park, you've broken your promise. You ever been there? What if I could bottle up your failures this week? How big a bottle do you think that would be? The false promises we've made. The things we've said at a Bible study. We've meant them at the time, probably, just like Peter. We sing songs of allegiance to the Lord. Oh, I'll follow you wherever you send me, Lord, as long as it's not too far away. I won't sin this way again, Lord. I'll come to church more, Lord. I'll pray more, Lord. I'll give more, Lord. I'll read the Bible more, Lord. But then we go back into the world and we forget conveniently all the promises we make him. In fact, we deny him in many ways the same as Peter does, but just by the choices we make by the way we talk, by the company we keep, by the sin we indulge in. We fail him, we fail ourselves, we fail one another. Every Christian ought to know the feeling of shedding bitter tears of repentance, right? Have we been there? Christians read this text, and if Christians have any sense at all, We should read this text and be frightened by it because it's just a mirror held up to us of our own failures. So that is a very cheery Scottish introduction. Those who've heard me before know know what to expect. We're miserable. That's the bad news. But there's good news in this text. Of course there's good news. There's good news in every verse of the Bible. The good news for Peter is his story doesn't end in Matthew 26, 75, Peter's story doesn't end up like Judas, does he? Judas denied the Lord, Judas betrayed the Lord, and Judas ends up killing himself. Peter's story goes the other way. The Lord still uses him to build the church. The Lord still uses him to be a key player in putting together the New Testament. But when we're reading verses 69 to 75, Peter doesn't know any of this. All Peter feels in that moment is a failure. Angry at himself, bitter, shame. What do you think Peter would have said to you if we could have walked up to Peter in that exact moment he feels those emotions and put put our arms around him and said, don't worry, son, it's not as bad as you think. The Lord is still going to use you. You think he would have bought that? You think he would have believed you? Don't worry, you're going to be a really 
You are going to be a great encouragement to the church. You're going to be a man of strength and righteousness. You're going to be a leader. No, not a chance he would have believed you. All he would have been able to see through his tears would be his failure. All he'd be able to, to feel shame over would be the enormity of his sin. He'd be thinking, how, how is God going to use a coward like me? I'm finished. And in the same way, that's how many of us feel sometimes, right? Don't we? Feel beaten down by our sin? Feel beaten down by our failures? I mean, the sheer number of times each of us who claim to know Christ have denied Him and shamed Him in our lives is overwhelming, isn't it? Think of the secret sins in this room. The stuff going on here that nobody knows about. You, know, you all look nice and clean, well, most of you. And, uh, you know, you've brushed your hair. Probably even some of the men have brushed their teeth. But there's secrets in this room. There's stuff people don't know about us deep inside the dark places, right? It's there. Of course it's there. The secret sins we're ashamed of. Hope nobody ever finds out. Maybe some of us are crippled with guilt, thinking this is it, I am finished, I am done. If this gets out, I'm in trouble. Maybe you've sinned again and you're thinking, I've done this too many times. I've blown it again. And we forget that God uses losers to accomplish his purposes. Isn't that good news? I know this is a Reformed Baptist, but that is definitely an amen, right? <laughs> Thank you. Often, people of our tradition, we, we, we put men and women in the past. I'll, I'll pick on Spurgeon, because he's every, everybody's favorite Baptist. And uh, we put him on a pedestal, and, you know, and, and rightly so, we, 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 we laud him and his achievements and, and, and the sermons he wrote and, and the books we wrote, but we forget that geezer, he was a man, by the way. Unless you don't know, Spurgeon was a loser. All right? I mean, I might write a book about it. He was a loser. He was a spiritual pygmy in many ways. He was used by God in many ways, but that's not my point. Frail, feeble, sinful people a whom the Lord chooses to display His grace, His mercy, and His power. How is His power made perfect, He tells us, through our weakness. We are jars of clay, liable to cracking, liable to chipping. And maybe you're here this evening and you've committed a sin. And maybe that sin's meant the end of your marriage. Maybe it's causing trouble in your marriage. Maybe your sins cost you a special friendship. Maybe your sins sent you to prison. Maybe your sin has cost you your ministry position in a local church, whatever that may be. Maybe it cost you your lifetime's work. Maybe it cost you your witness at work or at school. But you see, the power of the gospel and the grace of God means that just because one chapter in our life closes doesn't mean that has to be the end of our usefulness for the kingdom of God's. Okay, so maybe you can't pastor in a church again. Maybe you have to face up to some of the consequences of your sin. You're still forgiven. You can still be used, but perhaps just in very different ways. Maybe you won't win your spouse back. Maybe you won't get your church back. Maybe you won't get your position back. Maybe you won't get your friends back. But that doesn't mean we can't move forward in the Christian life in a way that is godly and gracious despite these things. You know, prison time doesn't have to mean the end of you, and you can trust me on that. The great thing about the Lord is that He doesn't use our sin against us. If we confess our sin, then he is faithful and he forgives and forgets our sin. He's not like us. He doesn't store it up to bring it up the next time we fail him. 
As far as the east is from the west, the Bible says, that's how far he removes our sins from us. And those scars we bear. We're four years older since I last seen Big A, and he's four years older, and so am I. We've got four years extra scars between us. I'm sure we'll measure them later. As has every Christian in the war. But those scars you bear can be used to bring pastoral comfort to the sheep that is going astray. We just show them our scars and warn them of the danger ahead. That's the beautiful thing. One of the weaknesses of, of, uh, of my church and a lot of 20 Schemes churches is because we are um, planting churches where there's nothing, most of our Christians are first generation new Christians. And that sounds dead exciting, doesn't it? But they're all lunatics. And um, what we lack is wisdom. We lack mature Christians. Grey heads, we call them, respectfully. Older saints who've been through the wars, who can lead the way and guide and give warning and comfort to the youngsters, who can show them their scars and say, listen, I'm still here, I'm still useful, I'm still loved, all because of God's great mercy on them. That's what older, mature Christians do, or they ought to be doing, is helping the foolish out of the pit and helping them to walk again as they regain their strength and confidence. But right now, as we get into Matthew chapter 26 and these verses, Peter is not aware of this. And so this text is a warning to the soul. It's in the Bible, therefore the Lord wants us to understand it, and it's good for our souls, even if it's painful to read. And if this text does nothing but make you fear your own sin, then that's a good thing. Because only the young, the daft, the immature, and the unsaved think that they'll never let the Lord down. I'll never deny him. You're saying that in your head right now, you're lying to yourself. I'll always love him. I'll never walk away from the faith. Foolish things to say. Whereas we, who have been in the fields of battle for a long time, know that we are capable of great acts of stupidity and faithlessness and so we remain constantly on our guard against the pull of the flesh and the devil in this life. And remember what's going on here at the point of Peter's greatest failure. Jesus has been mocked and taunted. Look, no accident that we read these words in verse 68. Prophesy to us, Christ, who is the one who struck you? Here's the great irony of this text. They're mocking Jesus for claiming to be a prophet, and in exactly the same moment... Peter is fulfilling Jesus' earlier prophecy of verse 34. That's heavy, isn't it? That's deep. Again, we've said it already. Peter, back in the upper room, said, I'll never desert you. Jesus says to him in verse 34, Assuredly, I say to you that this night before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. Peter goes on in verse 35, I'll never do it. Then we get the arrest. They all flee away. The high priest's palace, Peter's followed them at a distance, and the action swings into the courtyard in verse 68. And then we jump in to verse 69 and 70, which is Peter's first denial. The slave girl comes up to him and says, you're with Jesus of Galilee. Look at his, what he says. He denies it. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what you're saying, he says. Maybe it's someone who looked like me. But it's not me. There's denial number one. The, the second denial is quick on his heels in 71 and 72. Goes out the gateway, another girl. She also accuses him. Again, listen how he denies now with an oath. I do not know the man. This time he's angrier in his denial. He swears an oath that he doesn't know Jesus. He makes a sacred vow. I didn't know him. It's like saying... People who say, oh, I, I swear on my children's lives that this is true. I swear on my eyes or whatever. This, an oath by a Jew in ancient Israel was made in the sight of God. He's literally saying, I swear by God Almighty, I did not know this man. 
lying and blaspheming at the same time. That's heavy, right? Denial number three, 73 and 74. A little later, those who stood by came up and said, surely you are one of them, for your speech betrays you. Now look at his reaction. Cursing and swearing. I do not know the man. Immediately, the, the rooster crows. And again, more and more violent as he comes on. Literally, he's saying, listen, I damn well do not know this man, so shut up about it. And he throws in a few swear words for good measure. Now, I, I, the, 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 the nature of Peter's denials intrigues me as a pastor, and I'll tell you why. Because it always reminds me, one of my own life and sin, but also of, of working with sinners. I'm pretty much, I think, a world expert, uh, expert if, if I can say that without bragging, on spotting someone who's on drugs. Easy. I've lived with it all my life. I'm almost 50. Can you believe that? I'm almost 50, and I've lived with drug addiction for 48 years. Seen it, been around it, know it, participated in it. Second nature. I know so many in my church who's confessed faith in Jesus Christ. I know for a fact if they've been up to no good. It's written on the faces. It's written in the eyes. And here's, what, here's how it always goes when I challenge them. Challenge number one. You've been using. What, me? I never use mez. How could you think that, bro? Well, it might be the 30 years previously you were sticking a needle in your arm. But then they'll throw in a little bit of righteous indignation. Then comes the rage. Then comes the swearing. And all the while, they're fiddling in their pocket with that little wrap of heroin. Incredible, right? And in case you think you're any different, you're not. The lengths we go to to cover up our sin is staggering. The amount of self Deception. I mean, we generate so many challenges about our sin. The anger we will generate against that challenge, but knowing in our hearts full well it's right, is frightening. You ever done that? You got angry with someone? I mean, raging. Who do they think they are? You think you are? What about you? What about that person over there? Inside thinking, they've got me on that one. Scary. I, fright I frighten myself with my ability of self-deception. Luke 22, 60 to 61 records a detail Matthew doesn't. And it's a scary detail, at least to me. Immediately we read, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And then he adds these words, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Man, can you imagine that? In the middle of denying the Lord, and he catches your eye. Peter, who's confessed in one minute, denies him the next. I mean, can you imagine us caught in whatever sin it is we're engaging in? And in the exact moment of our, whatever it is, the Lord catches our eye. I mean, that would be heavy, wouldn't it? That would be heavy conviction. That would be absolute brutal I mean, the shame you would feel. And we read that Jesus catches Peter's eye. The rooster crows. And then we read Peter's reaction in Matthew, don't we? Verse 75. Before the rooster crows, the Lord says, you'll deny me three times. So he, he, he goes out, we read, and weeps bitterly. I mean, who among us doesn't know what this feels like? Have you never felt shame over your sin? Secret shame? Have you never wept bitterly at your own disappointment and failure before the Lord? And if you're sitting there thinking, not really, well, I worry for you. Of 
course we feel shame, don't we, when we fail the Lord. When we don't fulfill the promise we've made yet again. When that besetting sin yet again rears its ugly head. We thought we had it licked, we thought we had it beat, and but there it comes out of the blue. We cry, we weep, we think to ourselves, the Lord will never use me again. If I tell someone in the church, I am finished. If I confess this to the pastor, what's he going to think about me? And again, if you're sitting there thinking, well, I don't actually feel like that. That's not how I feel convicted. Then let me tell you then, you're full of sin and pride. There's some people who think, I'm not like Peter. I wouldn't have denied the Lord. And it you can't get through a minute of the day without falling into some sin or other. There's only one good thing to come out of this paragraph for Peter, and that is his tears, by the way. Because in, the, in those tears we read, we see his genuine remorse and shame. And that is a sign that the Holy Spirit is at work in our lives. You know, it, it, it's a phenomenon I've noticed more and more with younger people in my 20-odd years of pastoral ministry. I'll use an example. It's a vague example, so no one will ever know who they are. But a, a couple, a young couple in the church, not married, dating, had begun having sex together. It was clear. The young man in question came to me and uh, confessed it to me. And I said, look, um, they were both members of the church. And I said, right, I need to meet with you both, obviously, with my wife. And I met, and I talked to him, and I challenged him. And I said, it's a good thing. He was very weepy, teary. I failed, da 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 She remained completely impassive. And I, was, and, and I can't remember if it was my wife or I asked her a question and said, and how do you feel about, about the situation? And she said, point blank, I feel like I've got a peace from God about it. I've got a different perspective. So I have this peace from the Lord, so I feel it's not wrong. Frightening, right? Frightening. In that exact second, I knew she wasn't saved. No way she could be saved. No way the Holy Spirit of God would not bring convicting power down upon her head if she belonged to Jesus. She'd have been crying with her, with her boyfriend. Instead, she was adamant that she was okay. Listen, if you are in sin this evening, if you are caught in some sin, whether secret or otherwise, and you feel zero conviction whatsoever about it, then, oh my goodness, you are in a terrible place. And I fear for your soul. Bitter tears are good things in the life of the Christian. Because they show her a life. And if that's you, you need to repent immediately. You need to turn from whatever wickedness it is that you are doing. You need to get on your knees and you need to seek the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then you need to speak to someone in this church or who you know who is a mature Christian and ask them, to counsel you through the scriptures. The only people in the world who do not feel guilt about their sin are non-Christians. There's no such thing in the world, no such thing in the history of the world, in the scriptures, anywhere, where you will find an unrepentant Christian. There's no such thing as a Christian who does not grieve deeply over their sin, even though we are justified by faith through Christ. In that moment, we are free from the wrath of God. We still grieve through the sanctification process. God will not allow us to sit easy with our sins. You know, that's a blessing, that's not a curse. If God's not allowing you to sit with your sin, praise God. But if you're sitting with it here tonight and you're playing around with fire, 
Oh my goodness, you are in major trouble here. We're talking about the soul here. We're talking about your eternal destiny. It's not a game. Not play at this. Come in, sing some songs. Make each other feel better about some God stuff. This is eternity. Heaven and hell. If you've got peace in your heart while continuing in sin, then you are being deceived by Satan himself. You are demonstrating, actually, the fruit of your true spiritual father. Because the one sign that God has not left you, even in your biggest failure and your biggest sin, is this, tears. Holy grief. And if you've got holy grief in your heart, there's always a way back. Doesn't matter how far or hard you've fallen, you can be restored to God and you can be restored to a fellowship. It may well be that you cannot be restored to a position you held before. Or some relationships are now different. But you can be restored to the Lord if you truly grieve and seek him in repentance and faith. And here's the good news, like Peter, you can still have a role in the kingdom of God. Especially in the life of your local church. Right? There's hardly a person in this Bible of ours who does not pass through some great storm or commit some terrible sin who God does not rescue and turn around. So I always say to my church and, and, and to the church planters, the most pastoral and encouraging saints in the church are the ones with the most scars, the ones who have beaten, beaten up the most, the ones who've got scabs on their knees from the amount of times they've fallen but got back up. The saints who've been through dry times, hard times, thought a million times about just walking away. And yet, thanks to the mercy and grace of God, here they are, and they're here, young people, for our encouragement. Maybe some of them went away from the church for, for many years. I've had a man in my church who walked away from the Lord for 25 years. Committed a sin. It was a serious sin. Never went back to church for 25 years. I came back to the church. He turned up to a service one evening, broken, crying, grieving. Gloriously came back to the Lord. When you feel, if you feel that there's no way back, if you feel you're in a situation tonight where you're overcome with shame and guilt, then seek out a wounded sheep and let them minister to you. They're not, listen, they're probably not going to tell you what you want to hear. They're probably going to challenge you and make you feel a little bit angry. But it's going to be good for your soul. But let me give you an even better piece of advice than that. <laughs> seek out the crucified shepherd of ourselves. Because he loves you. He wants to bring you back into the fold. Jesus does not turn away the grieving sinner, genuinely shamed by their sin. He will take it from you, and he will send you on your way, strengthened for the battle ahead. So if you have no tears this evening for your sin, let me beg you, ask the Lord for them. Let me just end brief, quickly, with Peter's last words almost to the church, 2 Peter 3, 17 and 18. He says to the church, Therefore, dear friends, since you've been forewarned, be on your guard, so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless and fall from your secure position. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, this is uh, an unusual text, an unusual passage, Lord, and yet, Father, so convicting. Lord, we recognize, even as your children, we fail you, we sin. 
Often we do it purposefully. Often we do it even without thinking. And yet, thankfully, Lord, we do not have to live that way. But that if, when we come to you in repentance and faith, you are quick to forgive us and send us on our way. But for any in this building tonight who do not know what it means to weep bitterly over their sin, Lord, have mercy. Have mercy. And may your convicting spirit fall upon them, Lord. And may they bow the knee to King Jesus and receive um, new life in uh, the Lord's name. And we pray this in his name. Amen.